Hello, Dave. You're looking well today. Yeah, yeah that, that dot could technically be a little better than it is, one. Okay. That's where it should be. We should, like, almost not see it at all. There you go. Now you got the correct right pitch. Right below I'm Bill Whittle, and welcome back to the Firewall. Well, election season is upon us again, and so I thought I'd provide a handy voter's guide to the Republican Party to help make your decision just a little bit easier. Now, obviously, the one thing that everyone knows about we Republicans is that we're evil. But evil is a little too generic. There's no way to really separate the evil Republicans from the evil corporations that pay pretty much everybody's paycheck, or even the evil military that protects our freedoms and our right to be evil in the first place. So we have to be a little more specific, and the best way to do that is to use a Venn diagram. Now, the first thing that makes Republicans uniquely evil, at least according to the Democrats in the news media, is that we're greedy. Second, obviously, we're all fascists, and most importantly, of course, we're all racists. So, just to clarify things for you before you vote, let's start with greedy. According to Democrats, we Republicans are greedy because we're in favor of low taxes and limited government. We think you should surrender as little of your freedom to the government as possible, and you should be entitled to keep as much of your money as you possibly can. We think you're entitled to the rewards of your own work. We also think you know how to spend your own money better than the government who wants to take as much of it as possible. So as you can clearly see, we Republicans who don't want your money are greedy and the people that do want to take all of your money, the Democrats, are benign and generous. Just ask them. Secondly, we evil Republicans are all fascists. That's why students on college campuses never let us speak without throwing pies or chanting or screaming at us. According to those young Democrats, fascists are not allowed to speak and must be silenced by force in the name of freedom of expression. The word fascist, by the way, comes from the Latin word fascis, which means a bundle of sticks. It was used by a determined member of the Italian Socialist Party named Benito Mussolini as his metaphor for what he wanted for Italy. All of the individual sticks, which could be broken one by one, tied together into a huge socialist bundle, which could not be broken. Fascists believe in political violence to achieve their ends. Hey, just like the Occupy Wall Street people. This is a peaceful 
fascists are totally opposed to free market capitalism. Hey, just like the Occupy Wall Street people. They hate religion too, by the way. Instead, fascists believe in a powerful state-regulated economy which can bring just buckets of hope and change to the people of Italy or America. And the only private businesses that they approve of are ones under the direct control of, or at least dependent on, the government. Like, I don't know, General Motors, let's say, or Solyndra. But if we're not fascists, at least we Republicans are still Nazis, right? Well, as it turns out, the word Nazi is a German acronym meaning National Socialische Deutsche Apparatiparte, or NSDAP. Translated directly into English, Nazi means, no wait, hold on, that can't be right. It means National Socialist German Workers' Party. Well, what do you know? Turns out, you can't spell Nazi without Socialist Workers' Party. Isn't that interesting? No, we anti-socialist, free market, private property loving, pro-individuality Republicans are the opposite of both the big state government controlled bundle of sticks that Italian socialists called fascists and also the racial socialists called Nazis and even the international socialists called communists. You know, the guys in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Those socialists plus the Chinese socialists have killed about, oh, I don't know, maybe 150 million people so far. I know it's all very confusing, but no doubt Michael Moore will clarify it all in his next $30 million movie about how bad capitalism is. And finally, of course, we Republicans are racist. Now to prove it, let's go back to history again. Our Republican Party was founded in 1854 by anti-slavery, well, I guess they, they must have been anti-slavery racists, who departed the Whig Party and opposed the pro-slavery Democrats. The first presidential candidate for the Republicans was John C. Fremont, known as the Pathfinder. The Democrats went into full fear-mongering mode on this guy and said to the people, hey, if you elect a Republican, slavery is all but over. Well, Fremont lost, but in 1860, the second Republican candidate, Abraham Lincoln, did win. Between the date of his election and his inauguration on Monday, March 4, 1861, seven of the slave states in the Deep South had left the Union to form the Confederacy, left it before he was even sworn in as president, because they knew that the rise of us racist Republicans meant the end of slavery in America. And it did, too. After the war ended, Lincoln was assassinated by Democratic activist John Wilkes Booth, and then the racist Republicans passed the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, the 14th, providing due process and equal protection under the law, and the 15th Amendment, providing voting rights to blacks. The non-racist Democrats fought all of these things tooth and nail, and when the first black men were elected to Congress as racists, sorry, as Republicans, the Democrats got to work and founded the Ku Klux Klan to make sure it wouldn't happen again for a century. Democrats wrote the odious Jim Crow laws that kept blacks in position of slavery. All of those pictures that you've seen in the 1960s of, of people turning fire hoses and dogs on peaceful black marchers were unleashed by Democrats like Lester Maddox, Bull Connor, and George Wallace. You know, the great anti-slavery writer Frederick Douglass, also a racist Republican, once wrote, I recognize the Republican Party as the sheet anchor of the colored man's political hopes and the arc of his safety. The arc of his safety. Now, of course, Democrats can't argue with this history, mostly because it's true, although that's not usually stopped them before. So, what they say to justify this century of shame is that right around the time that they themselves, modern Democrats, came along, the parties mysteriously switched sides. Now, what really happened was that the loving, decent, progressive racism that's been a hallmark of the Democratic Party took a new and subtle form. They invented a new way to keep black people on the plantation, working for them like they used to. They gave them free food, free housing, and free medical care in exchange not for a harvest of cotton, but rather a steady annual bumper crop of votes. And the way that they did this was by telling black Americans that the Republicans that had fought and died for their freedom were in fact the real racists because we were against these new shackles like affirmative action and entitlement programs that keep them perpetually bound to their democratic masters. Well, it's true, we are against them. We're against affirmative action 
because we see people as individuals, not as a bunch of sticks, good and bad individuals. And we don't see black people as being so inferior as to need lower test scores to get into college. We think they can do just as well or as poorly as anyone else. We so-called racist Republicans not only quote, but we actually believe the words of that great Republican who said that he had a dream that his four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We believe that there is a word for people who are used by other people and provided in return with free food, free housing, and free medical care, and that word is slaves. And the Republican Party was, is, and always will be the party that frees the slaves. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Afterburner. I'm Bill Whittle. The Heritage Foundation recently published a remarkable study on poverty in America. Now, there's one set of graphs in there that you really need to understand, and here they are. This first one is a list of various amenities for all U.S. households. These are the things in percentages that we all have together, rich or poor. Now, right up at the very top, we see that 99.9% .9 of all Americans have refrigerators. 98.7% of Americans own at least one television, 84% have air conditioning, 68% own a computer, 31% have a video game system, all the way down to the bottom amenity, where we learn that only 6% of all Americans own a jacuzzi. Now, that's for all of us, for the whole country, rich and poor. Now, let's take a look at poor America. Not as much of a drop as you thought, huh? Given the rhetoric from the left since, well, forever. Didn't you expect poor Americans' lot to be much, much harder than this? Let's look at them side by side. The chart on the left is what all of America has averaged together, while the chart on the right is for the poorest Americans only. 99.9% .9 of all Americans have refrigerators. 99.6% of poor people do. That's good, obviously. 98.7% of all Americans own a TV, but only 97.7% of America's poor do. Well. They need the television so that the mainstream media can remind them hourly of what a terrible country this is. Air conditioning is down from 84% to 78.3%. Computer ownership falls from about ooh, 7 in 10 to 4 in 10. And the video game console, 31% for all Americans, plummets to only 29.3% for the poor. Now, needless to say, this report came under furious attack from guys like Stephen Colbert, who depend on snark or moral outrage to make sure that statistics like this don't sink in, because if they do sink in, it's time to ask ourselves some fundamental questions. Colbert attacked the report by expressing mock outrage that the poor have refrigerators. Hey, if you're a one-trick pony, you better know how to do the trick, right? No one's complaining about the poor having refrigerators. I'm not complaining about the poor having anything, not air conditioning or microwave ovens or multiple TV sets or video game consoles. I believe everyone should be entitled to the fruits of what they earn. The poor having these things is not the issue. But having them in this kind of abundance calls into question the kind of country that Colbert in particular and the Democratic Party in general say that we live in. Here are the households that have air conditioning. All households are the top line, poor households are the line below. But this graph tracks time as well as percentage. Now look at the two left dots. 36% of all households had air conditioning in 1970. 41.2% of poor households had it by 1980. In other words, more poor people had air conditioning in 1980 than the average American did in 1970. And computer ownership shows pretty much the same thing. About 15% of all households had one in 1980 compared to about 5% of the poor. But by 1998 or so, poor Americans had as many computers as all Americans had had only eight years earlier. And by 2005, the percentage of poor households with computers relative to average households with computers had gone from about 30% to about 60%. So as a general rule, poor Americans have most everything that the average American has. They only get it about 10 or 15 years later. You know, if you hadn't been told differently by your moral betters in the mainstream media, a fellow could look at these numbers and come to the conclusion that the rich get richer and the poor get richer too. Now, in a healthy society, we would look at numbers like this and we'd have a parade. Because if we lived in a healthy society, we could look at the fact that while average living space for all Europeans, that is a rich part of the world, is 976 square feet. The average living area for poor Americans is 1,228 square feet. 
In other words, for every four square feet that the average European has to live in, a poor American has five. In a healthy society, we would dance in the streets to know that while almost 40% of all African children show some sign of malnutrition and almost 50% of Asian kids do, all Asian kids, only 2.6% of all poor Americans, not of all Americans, but only 2.6% of the poorest Americans show any sign of malnutrition. We should have a parade, but we don't, and I know why. See, I've been poor. I've had to decide whether to pay the rent or the power. By the way, you can put off the rent a lot longer than you can live without power. I've looked for drop change below drive through windows at 1 in the morning. I'm six foot one, and for many years of my life, I weighed 119 pounds. I didn't have a TV or a cell phone or heating or air conditioning. And a few times in my life, the first thing I saw when I woke up in the morning was the sight of my own breath in front of my face. So this is not an attack on the poor. I've been there, and it's awful. It is an attack on poor mongers and poor mongering, a shot of perspective against using these Dickensian ideas of poverty to grab ever more money and power from that half of the country that pays these benefits and gets nothing in return but ingratitude, contempt, and demands for more and more and more. You see, when I was poor, I asked my friends for help, and they gave me some help. And when they wouldn't give me more help, I got angry with them because they were doing well and I wasn't. For people who've never been there, that is a hard thing to understand, this defect in the human heart. So how can I explain it to you? This is the best I can do. Imagine that you work in a large office building and that you're just one of 100 cubicles up on the 34th floor. And one Friday afternoon, the president of the company shows up and says, John, we've been watching you very closely. Your work has been exemplary. You've been honest, competent, friendly, and on time. So as a small token of our appreciation, we wanted to give you a check for $100,000 tax-free just to thank you for everything you've done for the company. And then he walks off. Now, needless to say, you're filled with unbridled joy. You immediately start to think about all the things that you could do with that money. You could put the kids through college, pay off the house, take a trip around the world. It's all gratitude and it's nothing but win. So you go to tell your coworkers about it and they tell you that the president had come to their desks too. He made the exact same speech, only everybody else didn't get $100,000. They got $300,000, every single one of them. Now what happens? Well, what a moment ago was a blessing and a joy has turned to bitterness and resentment. You no longer think about what you're going to do with $100,000. You only think about what you could have done with $300,000 just like everybody else. And if the deal was that everyone had to take their checks or else no one got them, I'm telling you now, there are people out there that would rather tear up $100,000 than bear to see everyone else get more. It's true and you know it's true. It's envy. That is one of the major flaws in the human heart and not a person in 100 is completely free from it. So why the envy over someone else getting that bigger check? Well, I think it's because we know that we didn't earn it. If that person had worked harder and longer than you to make more money, most of us would be okay with that. Not all of us, obviously. That's why we still have a professional left wing in politics, but most of us would understand it. But when it's a gift, the size of the gift translates into the size of our worth which is why the poor in America, by every measure, the richest poor people in the history of the world, and by a wide margin, are generally speaking now, not filled with gratitude for the assistance they get, but rather with envy and hatred for those so-called fat cats who are paying for their food stamps and their subsidized housing. Have you ever once, once, seen a person on assistance publicly thank the people whose extra work made that assistance possible? I haven't. Now, I'm afraid that this is the real poverty in America. It's a poverty of dependency and entitlement. Entire generations now, without any sense of control over their own destiny, stoked mostly by a Democratic Party whose full-time job it is to fan the flames of resentment and envy so that they can buy votes by promising people more of what their neighbor has worked for, because that's what it's come to today, now that half of Americans pay no income tax. It's us versus them not millions of the starving masses out on the barricades outside of a handful of powdered fops in the palace at Versailles, but one tax-paying American supporting one who doesn't pay any taxes, standing next to each other in the checkout line at Best Buy. Hey, fuck this place. Goddamn liberal fuck. Probably like eight guns out here somewhere, as it is. Fucking weirdos. Probably driving around that fucking Hyundai with fucking, fucking lowered shit that goes slow as fuck. And last.
What's going on, Tower? That's uh, one two four one zero. Hot Mike. If you don't have balls, man, if you're fucking rolling coal, man. A Southwest Airlines pilot is caught on a hot mic, bad-mouthing liberals and Hyundai drivers. That, no, that was her thing. Word quickly began to spread Tuesday night that the 26-year-old had been killed in an industrial accident. The doctor said that her hair got stuck in a Corvée in the, you know, and they tried to, I want to say they say they tried to cut it cut her hair, but they couldn't. She died on her way to the hospital. Thompson, who was employed through GAT airline ground support, was unloading baggage from a Frontier Airlines flight at about 10.20 p.m. Minutes later, her mother received the call. I just dropped the phone and was screaming and hollering. Mike Hugh, the CEO of GAT, says Thompson's hair apparently became entangled in the machinery of the belt loader. A co-worker of Thompson, who wanted to remain anonymous, spoke exclusively about what he witnessed. We were sitting there, we're sitting But did you know that you can tip your flight attendant on some airlines? I didn't know that, actually. Yeah. A Frontier started allowing its flight attendants to collect tips on drink purchases a few years ago, but the tips were pooled and shared among all members of the flight crew. Well, starting this year, flight attendants don't have to share their tips. The Association of Flight Attendants <laughs> opposes tipping, saying it's a way for airlines to pay crew members less and pass additional costs on to passengers. Reporter Jace Larson broke a series of stories in recent months about problems at the airline. Jace, pilots say the airline went back on their word about money. Yeah, pilots say they gave up part of their salaries back in 2011, and it was to help the company through some tough financial times. Well, the airline promised that when it was profitable again, it would renegotiate pay with pilots. Pilots tell me that even though Frontier is now showing a profit, the company has not kept its words. Pilots were out picketing today silently. The pay issue goes to an arbitrator tomorrow. Now Well, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle, and this is Afterburner. In the early hours of June 1, 2009, Air France Flight 447, a perfectly functional Airbus A330, descended into the Atlantic Ocean four hours into its routine flight from Rio de Janeiro to Paris. All 216 passengers and 12 crew members were killed. This is a remarkable accident, this one. Flight 447 experienced some heavy turbulence during the flight, but that didn't damage the aircraft or cause the crash. You can rest easy on that score. Modern commercial planes are stressed to tolerances far beyond what the atmosphere can dish out, despite the unpleasantness. The pitot tubes that measure airspeed appear to have iced over or otherwise become intermittent, and that was what started the chain of events that put that jet into the water. But blocked pitot tubes don't stop the airplane from flying. Air France 447 crashed because of a philosophy. Now, the short form is that Airbus believes that the plane is smarter than the pilot, and Boeing believes that the pilot is smarter than the plane. Airbus has decided, as a matter of philosophy, that the risk of pilot error is so high that Airbus jetliners simply cannot be put into flight regimes the airplanes consider dangerous. Automation systems in the Airbus lack tactile feedback. A command into one side stick is not felt on the other side. Auto throttles don't physically move when the power levels are adjusted by the autopilot, and so on. Hello, Dave. You're looking well today. Physically move when the power levels are adjusted by the autopilot and so on. Now, on the other hand, the pilots of Boeing jetliners have full control of everything the American jet has in the box. Yoke controls move in unison. Throttles mechanically move even when the autopilot makes an adjustment and so on. That perfectly flyable Airbus A330 stalled aerodynamically all the way down from its cruising altitude about 40,000 feet into the ocean. 
Now, stall recovery is the first maneuver that any fledgling pilot learns. It's simply the bedrock of your flight training. Laminar flow over the wing provides the lift that makes flying possible, but as the angle of attack increases, a point will come where that flow no longer adheres to the upper surface of the wing. The flow detaches, it becomes turbulent, and lift ceases instantly. Now, at that point, it's no longer an elegant jetliner. It's a half million pound anvil heading into the sea. Flight 447 crashed because while the pilot and chief co-pilot were pushing the left stick down, trying to lower the critical angle of attack and turn that anvil back into an airplane again, the inexperienced junior co-pilot in the right seat had his side stick held all the way back. The other pilots didn't know it, but the airplane did. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. And so the airplane averaged the two inputs all the way into the ocean. The Euro, like the Airbus, is heading into the sea. Like the Airbus, it didn't suffer a catastrophic failure. It's being flown into the ocean because several people are pulling in different directions at the same time. As on the Airbus, the disciplined mature nations, like Germany, are using austerity measures to push the nose down so that the European economy can regain flying speed. But panicked, hysterical nations like Greece are pulling back hard at the same time, trying to force the entitlements that simply cannot be paid for, in the same way that those two healthy jet engines could not power that aircraft out of the stall. Everybody knows it's going to happen. This is not a surprise. Desperately fighting to regain control of his jet, Air France First Officer David Robert's last words were, damn it, we're going to crash. A leaving an acrimonious debate with the intransigent incoming socialist leaders, Greek President Karolos Papoulias said, gentlemen, we are finished. They are finished. The EU was never a country. They couldn't do the easy things together, like manage their money, because they never had to do the difficult things together, you see? They never did the things that weld smaller states into a larger nation. Now, for example, during the second day at Gettysburg, the day before Pickett's charge, the entire Union line was nearly pierced by an earlier and massive Confederate attack. Men from all over the United States watched as 262 men from the 1st Minnesota Volunteer Regiment waded into the thousands and thousands of attacking rebels in order to buy a few precious minutes. 262 men went in and 47 came back out again. That's 83% casualty, still the largest losses ever suffered by an American unit. 25 Union states and 11 Confederate ones went into that civil war and one nation came out of it. If a German unit had taken 83% casualties defending Greeks right in front of the Greeks' eyes, would the Greeks still have shown the astonishing level of ingratitude and defiance they show today towards the Germans that prop up their entire economy? No. They would have cheered them to the rafters like the Union and Confederate men did that day. France, maker of the A330, has just voted down austerity in favor of bigger entitlements. The euro is being flown into the water, and all we can do is watch in horror. Meanwhile, in Wisconsin, it's starting to look like one captain under unbelievable pressure will likely be able to pull that state out of its economic stall and regain altitude. And all we can do is watch and hope. The debt crisis is as cold and unforgiving as the South Atlantic at midnight. The euro is going in. Whether the dollar follows it will depend on the courage and determination of men like Paul Ryan and especially Scott Walker. We're out of airspeed, out of altitude, and we're damn near out of ideas. And even if we do pull out, it's going to be very, very close. Hello, Dave. You're looking well today. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Stop, Dave. I'm afraid. 